Hello. Hopefully you can hear and see me. Um, welcome to the Weave uh, user group. My name is Tamo Nakahara. I run the developer experience team here at Weaveworks. And we are very, very lucky to have um, return content, constant updates on a very, very important project um, by Docker called Linux Kit. Uh, and key members of that project are Justin Cormack from Docker, who we're very lucky to have, and our own Ilya Dmitrichenko, who's here at Weaveworks. He's a member of our developer experience team, and does a lot of great work, and um, has been very involved in the Linux Kit project um, from pretty early on. <laughs> there he is. Great, so, um, so that's our talk today. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, but first, uh, a note from our sponsor, Weaveworks. Ilya and I work at this company, Weaveworks. And if you haven't heard of us, uh, we are the people, or core people on our in our company, are the people who brought you the technology RabbitMQ. We're a startup that's also backed by Google Ventures and Excel Partners. And we have uh, offices in London, San Francisco, Berlin, and uh, engineers around the world. Our main product is called Weave Cloud. And here at Weaveworks, we are dedicated to the concept of one-click ops so that you can spend time building your apps and you can leverage our operational expertise through our product, Weave Cloud. Uh, Weave Cloud simplifies your um, deployments, observability, and monitoring of your clusters. And I can show you a quick about 20 second video um, of Weave Cloud, uh, which is all uh, interactive and real-time experience where you get observability in this way into your clusters so that um, if you need information right away or you need to communicate with your teams you can get into that and we also have um, CLI capabilities as you can see here so you have different ways to get information that you need as quickly as possible especially when things go down so there's much much more as you can see th um, through automated deployments and monitoring that we offer with Weave Cloud, but that's just a teaser of a few of the things that we offer there. So if that piques your interest, please check out weave.works uh, and you can get a free trial of Weave Cloud and our DX team and others are there to help you in case you have any questions. Hello everyone. So today I'd like to talk to you about uh, Linux Kit, which, which is, I think, a much better way to do Linux for containers. Well, here is a disclaimer. All I care to run on Linux is containers. Perhaps, you know, I'll have an, an orchestrator that, that, that does duplication containers for me, but that orchestrator would run in a container also. So first of all, I kind of wanted to cover some of the really bad things I did in the past, so, so you might get an idea how um, uh, how Linux Kit is so much better in comparison. So uh, at um, at one of my previous jobs, uh, we we used to do this a lot. Like we would have this this kind of cron job on every host, and uh, it basically cloned the repo and ran puppet apply, making potentially destructing changes all the time and potentially breaking things all the time. Well, no, it was actually much, much better than uh, something that we had before this. So this was actually okay. Uh, and um, that's one of the things, right? And uh, after that, I've, I've discovered CoreOS. And I've done lots of interesting things with CoreOS. And uh, here's an example. So here's, uh, here's a systemd unit that is specified in line within a, um, a cloud init uh, YAML. So that's like a YAML syntax that wraps systemd syntax. And like it goes on for, for a few slides. So here we got a uh, unit called install v. Uh, this is how I, I had to install uh, VeeVNet on CoreOS. So here is like, you know, um, uh, here is a thing that, that says basically, these are all my dependencies. Uh, I want Docker to start first, and the, this install Vive runs before something that that's called Vive, and and then there's some description and stuff like that, and and uh, a, a link to documentation, which I never quite understood the purpose of. But in any case, um, there were some nice things here, but these these were like um, you know all very system D specific things, and system D is a pretty complicated um, way of managing uh, services on a on a Linux machine.
I don't know how many of you might have done a very similar thing, uh, but, but I'm sure some of you did. So, uh, so and it goes on, right? And um, and here we got like more stuff. And this 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 is actually when it gets to to what the thing does. It goes and creates some um, directory opt bin, and then and then it calls a curl to 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 download a a, a binary, and uh, and then make sure that binary has executable permission, and then it's like done, right? And then um, and then there's a little more to it. Okay, so I mean, I can I can talk a bit more about this. What what is actually happening here, right? So, uh, essentially, what, what what does happen is that uh, we we end up uh, specifying to to Core S that and uh, that we have, we have to go and download some software from the internet and install it in a uh, in in a directory called OptBin, which is one of the uh, writable directories on Core S, and then and then we make sure that that software starts up. And uh, I mean, first of all, we kind of have to download it, and then we have to um, modify some permissions on the file that we've downloaded, and then and then we have to actually run it, right? So I mean, think about the guarantees that this provides uh, in terms of like uh, availability of the the hosting. Uh, for example, here we we're using GitHub, right? And uh, this is actually subject to GitHub availability, right? And um, and there's no other way of doing it. Oh, look, here's a got we got the other slide, right? So there's no other way of doing it on Core S, really. The only kind of like way you can think of is uh, modifying the uh, base image that that you use, but then you can opt out of the of the Core S um, update model. And um, and here is like one other thing that that we had to do quite often is like you know override Docker options, and uh, and that's like another file, and you kind of have to understand this. What it really means, right? So it's kind of like a drop-in unit. What, what, the, what the hell is that? I mean, I kind of, I can, I can, I can tell what it is. I um, haven't used it, but like, you know, before I used it, I, I actually have no idea what this really means. And uh, there are some obscure Docker ops thing that I have to be aware of. That that, that apparently is understood by uh, the the other unit, but we have to be aware of that, and we don't have a definition of it unless we we've looked in documentation, and that actually had, may change, and then. It's kind of internal, and it's kind of like all really complicated, and there are multiple layers of um, abstractions that you have to to traverse when you when you try to to install some software on Core S that doesn't that that, that does uh, that operating system doesn't come with, right? And uh, you kind of all of a sudden find yourself breaking that immutability boundary that that you hoped you had uh, when when you thought you you'll be using Core S, which is uh, you know supposedly immutable. And uh, this, um, if I can get to the next slide. Gosh, I don't know. Um, the answer to your unrelated question about the number 50 on the WaveConf is it's an ordering thing so that, um, sorry, there's a question on the side about uh, where does the number 50 come from in the uh, 50 wavecubernetes.conf. It's so that services can start up in order, and so they're no, they're ordered by um, numerical order from well, sort order from the beginning. So you start things with fifty, and they're going to be before things that are called that are sixty, and after things that are forty. Um, um, but I think I mean I think that so those kit came from a lot of this frustration with this um, way that it's very difficult to. Manage um, um, manage Linux in a in a way that's really kind of simple and straightforward, and just runs exactly the one thing you want. And and um, so that some of the requirements that we had when we started building it was that you could just start up um, Linux. It would have everything you wanted to run already installed, and it would just um, just basically just start start all the services that you want and, and really just um, um, everything would be, would be bundled into a single small compact image that only did exactly what you wanted. Ah, oh, maybe I can share my screen. Yes, I can share my screen now, all right. So um, I just briefly introduction now. So I'm Justin Cormack, I'm an engineer at um, Docker in Cambridge. Um, I mostly work on open source products at um, 
at Docker, um, including the Docker engine itself and ContainerD and various other things. Um, this is what Cambridge is. If you don't know Cambridge, it's a small village that does science um, north of London. Um, and so I kind of gave you a little overview of how Lenskit works because that's kind of um, where we came to from this kind of model of not wanting to download things from the internet and, and just make a single static, straightforward Linux. Um, so like its name suggests, it's a kit. It comes with a lot of pieces that will get you started and you can assemble the pieces that we provide. Um, but if you don't like the pieces we provide, you can provide your own pieces. You can replace all the parts of it with totally different pieces. Um, all the pieces are containers, so they're really easy to build. Um, it's designed to be built in your CI pipeline, so you can treat it the same way as you treat um, anything else that you're building. Um, it's designed to build in just a few minutes, so that it's really, really quick, and you can um, you can then build it, test it locally, ship it to production, and it boots fast because it's really minimal. So the idea is you assemble all the pieces that you that you need to use to run Linux. Um, and in a, in a quite a simple setup, so um, we don't have a really complicated startup sequence like um, Systemd does. We just have um, a sequential boot startup and then a bunch of services that run using ContainerD. This design is exactly the same as a Kubernetes pod, if you know Kubernetes. So Kubernetes pods um, have sequential startup containers and then they have a bunch of services that run. Often people only run a single service, they don't know all the other things you can do, but it's it, the design um, is of Linux kit is kind of identical. As, so you can think of your whole your whole Linux machine as just being a single a single pod. Only some of the things it does are kind of um, systemy things. Um, um, the um, the setup for it is basically, uh, let me not open the questions in the middle of, um, the, set, the setup for this is, is just a YAML file, which is really convenient. So basically um, you set up the, the, the on boot things, which are the things that run at the start. So in this case, it's DHCP to get an IP address. And then um, this ex little example here is, is running Redis. Um, and so it, you, as you can see, it's just a standard um, Redis container from Docker Hub Redis for our Alpine with some additional capabilities. And then there's some, at the beginning we've got some kernel set up and you know, specific things that you obviously need to boot a machine. Um, it's different from most Linux distros in that everything in the root file system is immutable so that you can guarantee it doesn't change. It also means you can run it straight off an ISO or, or um, something like that. There's no package manager or any way to update stuff at runtime. You have to rebuild a new image. So if you want to build a new lens kit, you just build a new one and replace it dynamically. If you want to do dynamic stuff at runtime, then you use something like Docker or Kubernetes on top of lens kits, which is what many of our users do. And so it's a really, it removes all the sort of complexity that you have of installing, updating, and rebooting. You just Build a new image, replace and replace your replace your machine or replace your machine image, um, and so you can do a rolling up, you know, something like a rolling out service update to update all all the machines in your cluster with a new version of, of your base image. But you try and do that as not too often. Um, in terms of the practicalities. Um, there's a load of tooling for the different kinds of uses that you need when you're building machine images. You can build lots and lots and lots of types of image. Um, ISOs, I mentioned before, either EFI um, or BIOS ISOs, um, raw disk images, A um, images, A AMIs, GCP images, QCAL, um, which QMU uses, PhDs and VMDKs for VMware, um, just a plain kernel which you can boot directly using things like Hyperkit. 
you can build custom Raspberry Pi images and all the um, all the code for building these images is actually just a set of containers that um, that build the images so you can you can add new ones quite easily um, it's not it's not too much trouble um, as long as you understand the the how the disk formats work um, and you can we need to add a few more but um, um, because people have weird uses, but at the moment, uh, everything that people generally use is covered, and it's it's kind of easy to extend. So um, you can pretty much have a setup ready to boot on anything. So there were some questions here. I will. Um, um, yeah. So. Um, uh, David, yes, LearnsKit can build um, pixie boot images um, um, and run non-container workloads. You can basically, um, uh, we do quite a lot of pixie boot with um, ISOs on platforms like packet.net that will, you can HTTP boot a, an ISO um, using pixie, which is really convenient for testing and, and building. Um, And um, um, I'll, the other, so the questions about um, who's going to kit for? Why would someone use it? Um, the the most of our there's a whole different bunch of use cases for Linux kit. One is if you um, want to just build some sort of appliance that just does one thing. Um, a lot, we, we originally built it to run Docker and Kubernetes though, so I think that that's a, that's a use case that a lot of the people who use it want to do. They want a, a minimal custom system that will boot up either Docker or Kubernetes and then, um, like Ilya was saying, he just wants to run containers, he just wants to boot Kubernetes to run containers. Um, then there's also more specialist uses. Um, we use it for building Docker for Mac. Um, so that's the it's the Linux that's embedded inside that, um, and yeah. So it it is supposed to be deployed in production. Um, the idea is that you can build these immutable base images, deploy them in production, um, and then you can you know that when you test your base image, that you're testing exactly the same image as you're putting in in production in the same way as you do with a um, with a container. Hey, Justin, um, let's make sure we call out the questions. Yes, oh, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, that, yeah, that is a good point. Another question, is Linux in it a container? Um, actually, in it's one of the few things that's not a container. Um, it's, um, it's, um, it, you need a couple of little bits outside the container, and that's the, the init section is the things that actually have to start the containers, like actually running ContainerD itself. Um, but it does, it does come from, from uh, a container image in Docker Hub, right? So it's, it's yes, a container yeah. on the system, but yeah. Yes, it's built as a container, and it's, um, but it's not actually run as a container. Um, um, we, we have simple kind of tooling, which I'll show you in a minute when we're demoing, but you can basically build, push to a cloud provider, and then run. Um, and there are custom options for different platforms. Um, I, can, I can show you that. There was also another question about, um, does it run on bare metal? And um, the answer is yes, we, also, we do have bare metal support. We originally started off mainly supporting VMs, um, but we, we basically switched to supporting kind of common server hardware on bare metal. We have quite a lot of people running some bare metal platforms um, and there's loads of, inter of people doing integration with um, things like the automated IPIC season um, uh, um, that hardware vendors will, will now sell you or you can get from people like Racket and people like and Packets where you can do automated um, management of bare metal um, and so um, that's actually um, we actually have a lot of people who using LearnSkid on bare metal. Um, we don't have support for absolutely any driver for anything, but we have the common server hardware type drivers like 10 gig ethernet and, um, and so on. And we, you can always add custom 
possible for anything else. So I'm going to show you what a really, really simple. Um, Justin? Yeah. Sorry to bother. Um, just to, before you start the demo, I think maybe your mic is hitting your shirt because we're getting kind of swishes. So just. Oh, okay. I'll, it may be my. Okay, I'll get my. I'll try and keep my hands off. The, <laughs> All right. Thanks. Uh, um, so here's a little really really basic demo. This is our kind of hello world. Um, it runs um, nginx in a just as a real stupid example of a really simple thing. Um, it's more or less the one I showed you before. So you can just literally do Linux kit build, Linux kit YAML, and it will um, extract all the container images. Give me some little warnings about my signature being close to expiry. I should update it. Um, and so that's the that's basically the, the build process, um, which is, as you can see, is um, doesn't take very long. So there it's built, and then I'm just going to run this locally as a to, to see what it's um, just test it locally, and you can see Linux booting up. Um, Linux has finished booting up. Container D has started, and um, if I um, connect to localhost, I can see that um, I've got the welcome to nginx hello world page because I just didn't configure actually a, a page, but that's running there and I have a sort of minimal console that I've set up and I've got an IP address here. Um, I also have um, a, um, the, I've set up the, um, the container the um, metrics endpoint, um, so we can get our um, Prometheus metrics out of container D, which gives you a whole um, system Prometheus um, information, which is kind of nice. Um, that's an optional config, but it's really useful. Um, and that's really it. And once I finish with my machine, I can shut it down. Um, and so that's really how simple it is to just run Linux. It's really, really really straightforward. And then I can do um, exactly the same thing on um, GCP. I, booted, I built this machine um, with here, Linux get build minus format GCP. Um, and it will build us an image for GCP. Which is basically the same image, only this one has SSH in as well, so I can SSH into this image if I want to. Um, and again, let's look at this. Um, yeah, sorry, that was uh, someone asked if, what was that booting in? It was booting in Hyperkit, which is the Xive. Um, Xive compatible, I mean, it's an, it's a, it's the, the, our forked version of XI because XI is not really maintained anymore, but it's the, basically the same thing using the Mac built in Hyperkit. We have local support for booting on Linux with KVM and on um, Hyper-V on Windows. So you can use this on any desktop machine. It's, um, and yeah, we have Raspberry Pi 3 support because we have, um, no, this is being a little stung and interrupted. I can basically just run this on GCP um, in exactly the same way as I run it locally. Um, and um, here we are. It's um, again, it's just booting on GCP in exactly the same way. Um, and I can go to my. Um, Um, I can go to my GCP console and reload this, and we should have um, we should, yeah, we've got our machine up here. Um, I can 
I can SSH into it if I want because I set up SSH on this. Um, but, but you can see we're, we're in, this machine's in GCP, we can SSH, oops. We can SSH into that on GCP and, um, and it's exactly the same as our local machine, exactly the same boot process, exactly the same everything. So it's really, really, um, really, really straightforward. Um, and then obviously those are, those are really simple, stupid examples. We also have a, a whole project that we have for um, running um, Kubernetes, which um, we have it. Um, on GitHub at um, Let's Get Kubernetes. Um, and this is really um, one of the things that Ilya has been working on in particular. Um, so it's not much more, more complicated. If you look at the, um, at the, um, at what we have here, um, we have a, there's the same sort of set of YAML files. We divided them into into separate files, um, and um, they're more or less the same thing. With um, except that now it runs a kubelet, um, and then there's a bunch of other conflicts for different options. Um, adding so there's a there's a separate YAML file which adds the weave adds weave networking to this, which you can see if you. Um, um, has the same uh, 50 weave YAML setup that as before, and basically adds in weave networking into into the image. And again, I can um, just uh, basically boot this um, that I built earlier. It boots up, and it will initialize Kubernetes. Um, well, first of all, it will uh, get a DHCP lease, and then it will format the disk, which takes a minute, and then it set up a disk, a persistent disk for Kubernetes, starts container D, and then it starts bringing up, um, starts bringing up Kubernetes. Um, we can let's see what it started up. Yeah, it's, um, we can log into the um, Kubelet container. Um, and you can see that we've got a um, we've got a we've got a Kubernetes cluster that's um, just setting up at the moment. Um, we can see that it's um, it's um, just starting up all the services now, adding a few more. And, and that's Kubernetes coming up now um, in a completely um, repeatable, reliable way. Uh, you know, and we built this really simply. So um, it's um, it's a really, really, really straightforward kind of way of doing some stuff. Um, um, so. Um, yeah, so it's really um, it's, it's really really straightforward to really build quite com you know quite deploy quite complicated things like Kubernetes in this way, and um, you know it's a really small set of files. It's really easy to understand once you you know once you've got used to the idea. You can it's easy to build your own components because they're just a few containers that you're adding, um, and they're mostly just off the shelf containers. Um, and so um, it's really you know, I think it's a, it's a really quite a nice way of, um, of of working with Linux, and it's much more straightforward than um, trying to deploy Puppet and trying to you know get eventually hope that your system ends up in the state you want. You just build it in the state you want from the beginning. Um, um, so some more kind of questions. So. Um, um, yeah, someone's asking what's the difference between this and a Linux distro image on Docker Hub. You can't actually 
booted Linux distro image on Docker Hub on an actual physical machine or a, or a VM because it doesn't actually have the kernel and, and it doesn't actually, um, like the, the Docker Hub images don't actually um, start up services like DHCP to configure networking and um, you know, they don't have um, all the system level things you need like network time and things like that. Um, and so um, it's basically it's basically a kind of extra layer to add the bits that you need to run um, a container on a physical machine. As I said, it's a bit like, you know, it's really modeled on the Kubernetes pod. So you have a bunch of services that you need to run a physical machine, not just, not just the one image. Um, in terms of uh, someone else, can do, where do you specify a number of master and uh, linear nodes? So I just created a single node cluster here, um, which was a, because it was a kind of demo and a bit um, simpler, but I can, um, you, you can have um, the, the startup scripts that we have in the, in the example directory here, uh, um, basically the, um, let you create masters and um, do joins and so on just in the, um, in this it's a very simple boot script um so you can create masters the other thing is we have another project you can uh, use other projects to um orchestrate um linux kit so uh you can for example use terraform to deploy multiple nodes you can um we have a we have metadata services that can um be passed metadata so it can you can pass in as metadata um information on um, how it should join a cluster uh, and, and those kinds of things. So you can use some sort of service like Terraform or Infricate, which is another Mobi project, to actually orchestrate clusters of, um, of Linux kit nodes. Um, so yeah, you, um, so there's a, there's a, you can basically um, you know, pass in uh, join tokens and so on to, to actually join a cluster as part of the to bring up. Um, there's a question about Packer versus Linux Kit. I think um, Packer's really, really, really much more complicated because you have to boot up a machine, um, install stuff on it, um, snapshot it, and um, and then you know, so you, you end up with a much, much more complicated system. Um, so. Um, you know, it really is, with Linux Kit, it's just build, push, run. And so you can, um, you know, build an AMI, you build the image locally, push it up, convert it to an AMI and run it. Um, and it's just done. You know, there's no process where you actually have to boot it first to run um, install commands and stuff like that, like um, you do with Packer. So it's, um, it's, it's really, really, sort of drastically simpler and more straightforward and you can do everything locally on your laptop which i think is um really nice with 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 gcp um oops, what, the, the lights have gone off after so just just uh, i could just add a little bit to this so um yeah essentially the, the, there's one uh, one one other way to look at it is that with Packer you would usually start with like a debian or ubuntu ami that that somebody else has published previously, and and then you go and add a bunch of things on top of that. Uh, and uh, you know, if you go to to if you if you take the same Packer script to GCP, you can't suddenly use like the same AMI in GCP because there are no AMIs in GCP. So you got to start with a different image, and uh, yeah, essentially kind of like depend on something that comes from elsewhere. And uh, Linux Kit takes from scratch approach where, where you start with nothing and you just define all the bits that you want. So that's, that's like one way to look at it, right? So uh, in, um, yeah, so kind of like with Packer, you would have a base image that you start with that somebody else has built. And with Linux Kit, you're, you're, you're absolutely in control of, uh, of what goes into your image. Yeah, I mean, you've got one config file that you can commission to Git that has everything about um, your, you know, it has the total configuration. It has, we, we put exact um, hashes in here, so we know exactly, and we've got metadata on each of these things, so we know when they were built, and we can build it reproducibly, and it's, um, 
um, it, it's really, really straightforward because you know exactly what's in each of those images. You're not doing anything, you know, that, that might give you a different outcome each time you run this. It's um, totally reliable and you can, um, you can kind of treat this as a, um, in the same way as you, you know, you kind of treat building containers. It's that, it's that sort of order of magnitude simpler than the case with Packer. And Packer doesn't actually understand containers to the same extent, right? Uh, there, there, are, there are some, um, there, there's like a Docker provider, but that's a completely different thing. So if you, if you want to build a system where, where you would run a couple of demons as system containers, doing that with Packer is not straightforward. And, uh, and this is a, the primary use case for Linuxkit. Just want to jump in for a second. I know there are a lot of questions, and Ilya, you were um, answering some of them in chat. So, just in case you asked a question and it didn't get fully answered and we missed it, uh, maybe the best thing is to use the raise hand uh, ability in uh, Zoom. So, if I see your raised hand, I'll go try to scour through the chat to make sure that we've uh, captured your question. In the meantime, uh, Justin, are you done? Are you still? Yeah, I think I've, I know most of the things. Um, there's a question about adding kernel modules. And um, so basically, if you, um, the, our kernel config is, um, if you look in the Linux kit um, repo, um, we, our kernel config is um, here. And you, we have slightly different ones for each kernel version, but you can, it's a relatively generic com config that works for most people. It supports every, everything that you need to run containers in general. Um, if you want to change it though, and if you want to add other stuff, um, um, you can either up, upstream it. We're happy to take contributions if it's something that everyone would want to use, or if it's something that's specific to your use case, then by all means, just fork the code and, and push your own. It's, it's really, um, and, and just use your own kernel versions. It's really easy. Um, so things like SE Linux, we don't currently have in um, our kernel config. Um, we, do, we did have a project that was um, uh, planning to uh, introduce SE Linux support, and we would quite like to, um, Add it. I think it would be, you know, it would be something that um, would definitely be something that we would like to support, and we have discussed it and issues in the past. Um, so, so yeah, it, um, um, yeah, it's definitely something that uh, that you can you can add, and we would definitely um, help you add. Um, so we did have one raised hand, and I hope this is the correct question. Um, uh, the, the image for RPI3 is compatible to the Raspberry Pi Zero? No, the, at the moment we only have 64-bit um, um, images. Um, we spend a lot of time working um, with ARM and with packet.net on supporting ARM server machines. Um, and the only Ras and so we added ARM64 support as our first non-x86 architecture. Um, at, um, we have had people who'd like to add ARM32 support, and now we have all the infrastructure in place for multi-architecture. It would definitely be um, possible, but yeah, at the moment you need Raspberry Pi 3. Excellent. Did you catch any of the last questions that came in? Looks pretty good. Um, there was a question about where the DHCP config comes from. So the way we um, have it is that the, the DHCP package comes with a, a relatively same default config. Um, oops, if I try and move that window. Um, um, so um, um, so if we look at the DHCP package here, which is just a normal Docker file, we have the default config here, um, which generally works for most people, but if you need to change it, you can basically just um, add, a, 
add an override config and, and put, add that into the, um, the YAML file and replace this config with, with, um, with a different one. So it's, um, it's really quite simple to, you don't have to actually change the GHCP package to change the config file. You can just bind mount a new config in instead. Um, but generally it's, you know, we, we try, we try and provide defaults that work for most people. Um, it, um, you know, it, it's worked in, it works on um, desktop and it works in all the cloud providers we use. So it's kind of um, reasonable. Um, we, and then we have some uh, custom config for some providers in the metadata support for um, things like multiple IP addresses um, as well. So. Excellent. So we're getting toward the end. Ilya, did you want to go back to parts of your presentation or? Let us know. Sure, sure. It's a, it was a it was originally a pretty short deck, so I can sort of run through it. It's kind of like what I'm trying to say here is that really like my perspective on on uh, on what I think is great about Linux Kit and uh, you want to share that screen? Yeah, I'm going to share my screen now. Okay. So it's um, yeah the day, uh, my um, um, yeah it's kind of like it's about my perspective on um, you know um, why I care about Linux Kit, which which could potentially be a reason why you might want to care about Linux Kit. Uh, it is entirely up to you, but I just want to tell you why I care. So I've done pr pretty pretty nasty things in the past with config management tools such as Puppet. I've also done a bunch of things with CoreOS more recently and uh, have kind of given up on that. Uh, partly because like this, this kind of stuff, it's it's uh, it's easy to write, but then it's it's hard to test and it's hard to, to, to understand once. Uh, you, you're not so familiar with system D and uh, and the core OS and, and all these things uh, and um, yeah and it's kind of like it's all evaluated at runtime and it already subject to like availability of things you download your software from and customizing uh, the the OS is kind of hard basically and uh, and yeah you end up doing lots of weird things uh, you often don't understand um, so um, and like you know, uh, so CoreOS does define an immutability pattern, right? And, uh, and and I want to talk a bit more about the theory of this. So uh, first of all, what what, what do, does the uh, immutable OS pattern provide to us? It's it's mostly about security and reliability. Right? So you you say that you know your operating system is not going to change. In, in a number of ways, and uh, preferably there, there are very few ways in which it can change. And uh, it gives you security by means of, you know, sealing the system. Uh, so there is no, no way somebody could rewrite a, a binary at runtime, for example. Additionally, reliability is about um, how uh, reliably it boots every time. Right? So you define a, a, an immutable system in which you you have very little logic that is executed at a boot time, and uh, it thereby will boot very reliably uh, because uh, because it will always do the same thing. So the the boundary of the immutability is something that is entirely up to you as a as a system designer, right? So you go and uh, say, okay, well, I'll just make my system immutable by mounting everything in uh, uh, in slash bin and slash user bin uh, re read only, right? Or I'll mount everything read only except for TMP, or I mount everything read only except for TMP and var and Etsy. So um, you know, the, these are some some of the things you 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 may do if you if you are defining your system as immutable, but you could also define um, you know your immutability fairly relatively and loosely. And uh, here we can talk about weak and strong immutability. So in the the case of weak immutability, you, you could think of the system as it as if it was immutable, and uh, things uh, things are perceived to be read read only, but actually. Uh, you know, you, you 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 allow for certain legacy software to function normally by not actually mounting file systems read only, but only uh, only um, ensuring that whatever you use to manage this system uh, doesn't doesn't actually modify um, the file system uh, like out of blue. 
So you 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 don't uh, you 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 put an image once and then you don't run run apt for example, right? Or you don't install any software updates until you build a new image. So the, the software updates only come as a new image or something like that, then you don't actually enforce immutability. And th that is potentially one, one approach to that. And, uh, and the different approaches, uh, you know, to do strong immutability where uh, certain parts of the file system are mounted read only and, uh, and, and nothing can actually, uh, you know, override any of the software or configuration you may have. Uh, and um, and you kind of enforce that, and that's that's the kind of thing that Linux Kit does. And additionally, you know, there are kind of like halfway options where, like, uh, let's say in CoreOS, you you would have Etsy and opt read read write also also var and TMP. Well, usually you you you'd you, you'd allow um, uh, your software to write to to var and TMP, but then everything else you you you'd Probably want to mount read only, and uh, another thing that does happen in CoreOS, for example, just just to, to sort of uh, illustrate the immutability, the the how relative the immutability boundary is, is that in CoreOS uh, the the disk isn't actually immutable, right? So so you you actually partition the disk and uh, and the file system image uh, will 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 be written to to partition A, and then if there is an update. It will get downloaded and will get written to partition B. We'll reboot into partition B, and then, and then you know, if we have an update, we'll we'll download that into partition A, and we can keep flipping back and forth. So uh, you know, while the file system when it's mounted is kind of read only. So that that's kind of like you know, you, you can define that boundary anywhere you like. It's it's up to you. So you know, as the um, uh, as um, uh, as we look at Linux Kit momentarily, we will we'll see where, where Linux Kit defines those boundaries. So uh, you know, you, and you could also make your opinions about runtime downloads and config. So in CoreOS, as I showed earlier, you, I, I was actually downloading stuff at runtime and uh, configuring it as well. And uh, you know, when when you you design an immutable system, you 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 would have to pick uh, the 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 boundary at which you would, you would want to uh, allow certain certain types of configuration. So, for example, uh, in a Linux kit based system running Kubernetes, uh, none of the the system software is uh, downloadable or configurable at runtime. Everything is baked into the image, but the applications uh, obviously are configurable and downloadable at runtime. But that's managed by a separate layer, which is the Kubernetes API. So in Linux Kit, uh, the kind of the, the specifics of these things come down to the fact. Basically, Linux Kit is uh, is is, uh, is is enforcing a strong immutability boundary by uh, mounting most of the the file systems read only, uh, except for uh, var uh, varlib Docker and uh, and TMP and and some of the other things. Actually, none of the other things. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was going to say that uh, you know, unless you customize, if, unless you build your your custom Linux Kit image, you 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 may wish to define certain other file system that that you may want to mount read write, but um, most of the things will be read on by default. And uh, there there is no um, boot up config complexity. So if you, if you consider Linux Kit versus uh, system D based system, system D takes a bunch of unit files from from its uh, from its path and uh, evaluates those based on a whole range of different parameters. While Linux Kit doesn't do any kind of evaluation like that. All the configuration is defined in a YAML file and can be traced back to two packages like the package configuration files, but um, it's all. Uh, I mean, do do have a look at it. You you you'll you'll uh, you'll get a better picture when once you you have a go at Linux Kit. If you know if, if this is the kind of topic that that you care about, so uh, it essentially yeah, avoids all the complexity that that some of the alternatives like Chorus uh, give you, where some um, component like System D takes takes a lot of uh, different parameters into account and evaluates them. And uh, Linux Kit additionally provides uh, for testability. There is a regression test framework that, that you can look at, which, which is still in its early days, but uh, it actually allows for, um, for testability.
So why should I care? Well, um, it is all about a uh, great user experience for us, right? As we, we're working on um, uh, Kubernetes distribution based on Linux Kit, such as Docker for Mac or, uh, or the Linux Kit Kubernetes project. Uh, um, that, 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 that is all about really the, the user experience, allowing you to, to put a, a bunch of Linux uh, VMs running Kubernetes pretty easily and quickly and reliably. So the artifacts that we ship end up being the ones that you run and, uh, and uh, they, they guarantee to, to put very reliably. Excellent. Actually, we're out of time, so I was curious. Okay. If you have a last, uh, that seems like a great place to, to wrap up. No, I'm pretty much done, yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. Yeah, so well, I, I was just going to say, so one of, one of the things you'd be able to do is ensure that, that your um, uh, local image that you, you run with an SKIP locally, the, the, that would be identical to, to the one you can run in production. That's one of the, uh, the key advantages you get from it as well. So Excellent. you can actually run the same image in, in Amazon and uh, the same image on, on any other cloud provider or, or local virtualizer. So yes, you can see our closing slides. So thank you for joining our Weave user group. And thanks again to Justin and Ilya. If you'd like to um, try out Weave Cloud, as I mentioned, or you have any questions uh, about our topics that you'd like to know more about, we have a lot of great uh, expertise within WeaveWorks. So please join our Slack channel if you haven't already. And if this is your first time joining this Weave user group, then please make sure you've joined um, the group on meetup.com uh, because we have great uh, guest speakers and our own um, team speaking on a variety of topics that hopefully you care about. Um, so thanks again, and we'll see you at the next one. Goodbye. Thanks, Justin and Ilya. Bye. <laughs>